Hi, this is Mark Birch with a quick analysis of John Donne's selected poems. Hi, welcome back. I hope you've uh, watched the first part of this, because if you're starting at the second part, you're crackers. Um, having spent the first two stanzas rejecting the criticisms posed by this kind of hypothetical addressee, Dunn appears to reject those criticisms as meaningless at the beginning of the third stanza. Call us what you will, you know, say what you want. Instead, he now moves on to a consideration of the nature of love itself. He states, call her one, me another fly, where tapers two and at her own cost die. An incredibly complex couplet and Dunn's representing his lover and himself as flies. Although we need to bear in mind that for the Elizabethan, this is likely to be a reference to a butterfly or a moth, um, hence, you know, butterfly. Uh, the suggestion is that the addressee refers to their love as something small and insignificant. Notice that that's just the addressee that would be making that claim when for Dunn, obviously, it's quite the opposite. Um, so Dunn takes this perceived criticism and extends the concept in order to explore the nature of their love. They're not only butterflies or moths, but also tapers or candles. And just as a moth is drawn to a candle flame, so Dunn is drawn to his love and she to him. They're both moth and candle in the sense that they attract each other. So what seems potentially paradoxical is resolved by this recognition. There's also a sense of danger represented by the intensity of the attraction at our own cost die. And obviously, superficially, that seems like it's going to be a reference to uh, the moth or the butterfly flying into the candle flame and dying. But that's mitigated by Dunn's pun on the word die, which we've come across before. It was used by the Elizabethans as a euphemism for orgasm and so could be a reference to the lover's sexual relationship. It alludes also to that common Elizabethan belief that orgasm reduces life expectancy by a day, hence their death. He continues this imagery of things that fly through reference to the eagle and the dove, and we and us find the eagle and the dove. And once again, you've got this sense of two within one. The eagle traditionally represents masculinity and power, terribly sexist, while the dove represents femininity and peace, terribly sexist. However, they're one unit of love, they're, that is combined. It's in us that there exists the combined force of these two potentially contrasting forms. Uh, Dunn's presenting them as a, a unit, as a single force of love, rather than two distinct individuals. And if we have a look at uh, the internal rhyme, and we in us find the eagle and the dove, we get this sense of connection that's crucial to Dunn's representation of their love as intrinsically connected. And finally, this uh, sequence of images associated with flight concludes with a reference to the phoenix. Um, this also concludes the series of ideas relating to the two lovers being one. They're both fly and taper, eagle and dove, phoenix and fire. Um, if you're not familiar with the phoenix, it's a mythical bird that was effectively immortal, given that it would die in fire and then rise again from the ashes. So Dunn's claiming that the mystery or riddle of the phoenix is made more significant or half more wit by the way in which it can be applied to him and his lover. So he states, we two being one are it. In the same way that the eagle and the dove are conjoined to create a neutral form, so together they become one as the phoenix. So he's reasserting this claim that they are one. They will die and rise the same. Their love being as immortal as the phoenix. But Dunn may also be making that sexual pun on the words die and also rise in terms of erection. The fourth stanza begins once again with the reference to die, uh, carrying the connotations of sex. We can die by it, if not live by love. And again, that could resolve the apparent paradox within the antithetical parallelism. Die by it, live by love. So that death could also be taken more literally. Uh, the pronoun it could be clarified categorically by love. 
so it could be love. So Dunn seems to be suggesting, if this is the case, that even if they are not allowed to love in life, they will continue to love in death. The harmony created by the parallelism, and parallelism almost always creates that sense of uh, harmony and balance, and the alliteration of the soft L sound could complement this sense of the eternal nature of love. Dunn seems to be suggesting that if the wider world can't recognise their love in death, through the symbols of their death, the tombs and the hearse, um, then they will appreciate it in his poetry. He says tombs and hearses may be you know, the conventional method of commemorating the dead, but they're not sufficient for commemorating a love of this kind of magnitude. Instead, verse is required. It will be fit for verse. And if no piece of chronicle we prove, we'll build in sonnets pretty rooms. Uh, well, chronicle here suggests an historical document. Their lives might not feature in those kind of historical accounts um, because they're not historically significant individuals, but their love is significant. On, the, on a world stage, their love is significant. But sonnets, which are the traditional forms of love poetry, would be the most apt form for their kind of immortalization. Um, the reference to pretty rooms is an interesting one in terms of it functioning as a metaphor for the way in which their love can eternally inhabit the verses of sonnets. Uh, and that word inhabit's been chosen purposefully. You know, these are the rooms for them. But it also works as a literary pun because uh, stanza is the Italian word for room. And Dunn is likely to be imagining the Italian sonnet form here. Now, the sonnet may be a short form of poetry, but Dunn recognises that form in which something is contained doesn't define it. And he uses, again, this comparison to death in order to make that point. He uses the comparison of the well-wrought urn or half-acre tombs. Both of them are apt containers for the dead. Um, just as apt, in the same way that a chronicle would be just as apt as a sonnet. It could also function as an extension of the social criticism evident in that first stanza, uh, that to strive for social betterment only results in death, and all are equal in death. It doesn't matter how hard you've worked, how much money you've made, how much power you've accrued in life, you will still end up as ash. And then it doesn't matter whether you're in a half acre tomb or a well wrought urn. Dunn refers to the verses as hymns, introducing the semantic field of religion to prepare the reader for the sense in which the lovers should be canonised for love. The verses will effectively function like urns, where their love will be recognisable to everyone. The profound nature of their love will be such that all shall regard them as miraculous lovers worthy of canonization. Now, in the Catholic tradition, a believer could invoke a saint to act on their behalf. And here, Dunn imagines one who believes in the canonized lovers praying to them. So they've effectively become the saints of love. He uses this register of a prayer to capture the way in which the lovers would be worshipped by future generations. If we listen to the bit that's in direct speech, it does sound hymn-like or prayer-like. You whom reverend love made one another's and so on. The lovers are once again identified as unified, one another's hermitage. And so there's that kind of symbiotic relationship that we saw earlier with the phoenix and the fire, the eagle and the uh, dove, etc. And the semantic field of religion is employed once again. A hermitage is the dwelling of a hermit, usually someone who's chosen to live in seclusion for religious contemplation. But here, the poetic voice and his lover are presented as each other's hermitage, like the moth and the candle. They are the sanctuaries for each other. They attract each other. They're the refuge for each other. And it seems that the future lovers recognise the poetic voice and his lover's love as one of peace. 
But love at this future point, this hypothetical future, has been transformed to rage. Those in the future need to aspire to the love exhibited by the canonized lovers. So Dunn's imagining a time where rather than being criticized for being love, people will actually appreciate the value of this love. The transformation of love is conveyed through that use of antithetical parallelism, inverting its quality. Love was peace, now is rage. And so, you know, this, this inversion complements that sense of the way in which, you know, there's this bizarre criticism of those that love peacefully and beautifully and yet are criticised for it. The canonised lovers are presented as a microcosm of the world's soul. A contract may function as a homographic pun, meaning to reduce in size, contract, hence the microcosm, but also contract to form an agreement. In the latter sense, a contract is formed between their love and the world's soul to act as this ideal of love. The asyndetic list of countries, towns, courts, represents the endless aspects of society that will seek guidance from these canonized lovers. And it's these aspects of society that are driven into the glasses of the canonized lovers' eyes. So those eyes are transformed to glasses or mirrors. The countries, towns, courts look into those mirrors in the hope of finding a reflection of the pure love exhibited by the canonized lovers. It's their love, their pure love, their refined love that's idealized. And the hope is that by uh, gazing upon it, they will get a reflection of that back to be prized by them. Their love is this perfect example of love. They epitomize love. And it's this epitome of love found in the canonized lovers that society seeks. Hence, they are a pattern of love, which appears to be a reference to an ideal in the same way that um, you would have an, a platonic ideal, something to be measured against. Um, and this kind of Neoplatonism is something that uh, Dunn does refer to on a number of occasions. If you're not familiar with platonic ideals, a basic idea is that we all have, um, Plato would suggest, an idea of something that we can use to measure other things against to decide if they are like it. So, for example, if we have a book, we can go, ah, is that a book? I will refer to my platonic ideal. Ah, it has pages, it has a cover, it has words in it. Yes, it's a book. And even though I pick up something else that looks very different and feels very different, maybe has many more pages, I can still apply that ideal of a book to decide whether it is a book or not. So in terms of the structure of the poem, it's written in five nine line stanzas, the regularity of which could represent the enduring nature of their love. The meter, well, it's iambic throughout, um, but it switches between pentameter and tetrameter. Although the final line of each stanza is interesting because that's trimeter, creating a kind of shocking brevity uh, that adds weight to Dunn's conclusion at the end of each line, uh, sorry, at the end of each stanza. Um, in terms of the rhyme scheme, we've got ABB, ACCC, AA. So a limited range of rhymes, perhaps helping to complement this sense of profound connection, mirroring the profound connection of their love, because uh, so few rhymes are used, the connection's made all the more evident. And in terms of form, we've got a dramatic monologue again, allows Dunn the opportunity to confront his critics in a very immediate style. Okay, thanks ever so much, folks. Take care. Cheers.